Okay, welcome everyone. Many thanks for joining this session at a World Water Week. This session is organized by the 50 Liter Home Coalition, which is a global initiative that addresses two of the most pressing challenges of our time, which are water security and climate change. We propose at 50 Liter Home Coalition that the solution for the water crisis starts at home and that the answer should, should not involve a sacrifice in people's quality of life. Our ambition in our coalition is to achieve a daily 50 liter per person net zero living that feels like 500 liters. Whilst addressing water security, we also aim to support climate change objectives since water, heat, water heating is the second source of greenhouse gas emissions in the home. The 50 liter home coalition was launched in October, 2020, and it is supported by an emerging group of global leaders. That includes Electrolux, NG, IKEA, Procter & Gamble, Kohler, and Suez. And this week, we are very pleased to, to welcome IKEA as our new founding member in the coalition. Tobias, who is joining us today, will explain later a bit more about the amazing work that IKEA is doing uh, in achieving uh, their, their objectives on water. The coalition is also uh, collaborating very deeply with a growing and diverse group of partners that consists on Arcadis, the Netherlands Water Partnership, and the Water Reuse Association in the United States. And this, and this very interesting and exciting coalition is convened by three secretariat organizations that includes the World Economic Forum, the 2030 Water Resources Group at the World Bank, and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Over the next year, our ambition is to expand this fantastic group of partners and really start engaging deeply in cities with not only with private sector organizations, but also with public sector, as well as government uh, stakeholders. Our ambition is to demonstrate the value proposition of this coalition by articulating and developing innovations that are relevant to both water stresses that exist in, in cities, as well as uh, reducing energy consumption and, and help citizens to achieve net zero living. Our second objective is implementing these ideas and demonstrate how this future looks like. And we are aiming to explore those piloting, those implementation uh, opportunities globally. Armed with this evidence, we then uh, plan to explore more uh, education space so that we can help others, help people and citizens to really engage differently with water and really uh, learn to live uh, more efficiently in, in terms of the water consumption. And finally, our plan is support uh, governments in implementing and articulating policies that basically respond to the new reality that is deeply uh, informed by our clim climate emergency. The topic that inspires this discussion today is of course a one specific topic within this large challenge. This is really about the nexus between water and energy. What inspires us and the reason why we're exploring in our coalition uh, the, 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 the water and energy nexus is because of very interesting recent work that has emerged from a number of organizations. For example, in 2018, the California Energy Commission highlighted that one of the key sources in energy consumption in Californian homes is water heating. This work and this finding has been recently confirmed by a recent study led by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and WBCSD. Very importantly, the academia in the last couple of years have uh, also produced information and, and publications that highlight the importance of exploring water from a perspective uh, that highlights the, the linkages to other sectors and other systems. This has been uh, published in 2020 by a group of researchers at the University of California in Riverside who highlighted the importance of exploring water through their in interconnectedness with energy systems, as well as uh, the, the cultural and educational aspects. And more recently, Spang, Manzor and Lodge at the University of California Davis highlighted that very often 
water conservation initiatives have very important co-benefits in terms of energy, reducing energy consumption in the state of California. So what we are planning to do today is really share a little bit about the work that our coalition members are doing. And for today, we're, we have prepared a very exciting panel that uh, I hope you will in, enjoy as much as I will. That includes specialists from a number of organizations that you can see on the screen. These include Arcadius, IKEA, and Procter & Gamble. These are private sector organizations, leading private sector organizations in their field. And, but also we wanted to have the perspective of the doers, the, the ones who actually work on policy and work on delivering these important ambitions. And we have experts from Catholic Relief Services and their team in Sierra Leone, as well as the Netherlands Water Partnership, one of the leading partnerships in the water sector globally. So as a first step, and I, I would like to, uh, to invite Anusha Shah, who is a senior director at, uh, of Resilient Cities at Arcadis, to, to, to tell us a bit more about their work at Arcadis. Anusha has an extensive experience in consulting and engineering. She is one of the vice presidents of the, the Institute of Civil Engineers in London. She's a non-executive director at the UK Met, Met, Met Office. She's a visiting professor at King's College London. And in 2020, she was uh, chosen as one of the top 50 women engineers in sustainability. It's an honor and it's a pleasure to collaborate with you, Anusha, in our coalition, and it's fantastic to have you here. So to start our conversation, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your motivation. Arcadius is one of the leading uh, companies in design and engineering and consulting. And uh, we were, I was wondering, what are Arcadius' motivations to support nonprofit collaborations such as 50 Liter Home and help them explore complex issues such as our ongoing water, energy, and climate research? Over to you, Anusha. Thank you so much, Braulio, for the kind introduction. And I just want to say how delighted I am to be a part of this hugely, hugely important forum. Um, could you please move to the next slide, please? Thank you, Braulio. So I think I start by emphasizing that uh, we are in a climate and nature emergency, and it's established that we will need a whole system change if we have to avert the negative impacts of the emergency and equally use this as an opportunity to redesign our homes and cities and generally improve quality of life whilst improving biodiversity. And improving quality of life has been the mission of Arcadis from inception. So what prompted us to join the coalition was its vision. Its vision of tackling two critical issues, um, climate adaptation with a focus on water scarcity and limiting water consumption to 50 liter and making that as an irresistible aspiration and making it as five, 500 liters. And secondly, the aspiration of a zero carbon home through the use of less water. And as Brolio, you said, there's such a close connection between the two. So this helps tackle mitigation part of the climate emergency. And also the coalition is very system focused and action oriented, which matches philosophy of Arcadis. We genuinely believe it's time for bold solutions, for unconventional cross-sector collaboration, for behavior change and for seeking multiple benefits in co-creating solutions to solve these global and local challenges. So we're really keen to shape people's relationship with water and energy, inspire them to use um, the natural resources responsibly, and, and overall like deeply understand cultural drivers in each country. So we're really excited to be working with the coalition and what we bring to the table is a very diverse knowledge and experience in the end-to-end -end system from drinking water, distribution, building systems, wastewater and water management. And in general, we can help make necessary changes in the entire value chain. Um, next slide, please. So coming to the water, energy and carbon nexus. Uh, so if we see eight of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals can be attributed to the nexus. You have water, energy, carbon, sustainable cities, communities, and, and actually to peace ultimately, to justice and having strong institutions. So if we focus on one of the three areas, water, carbon, or energy, um, it can either result in greater impacts of the other two or, or negative impacts. I think the trick is that the challenge is the equilibrium reduction of all three to truly create that difference, that, that nexus. 
So on this, everyone has a responsibility, as you said, Brolia, at the start. So it's about how do we make change with that climate action? So this is a bottom up from households to top down from policymakers and legislators of new buildings, existing buildings to products, consumers, uh, how we use things in the office and as practitioners, we systematically devise those innovations that make the journey, the whole journey really smooth. So at a macro level, the nexus is very clear, you know, the energy is needed to pump, transport, treat water, transfer water to homes, but equally what is needed to produce energy, be it fossil fuel, biofuel or renewable, but much less obviously for renewables. Now, zooming into the domestic household level, one basic quick win is rethink of wastewater from showers, toilets as a resource. And in Singapore, they call it new water. By reusing that water, um, we can help reduce water use, reduce energy, reduce money um, in, in treating that water or even to supply water, improve landscape. I mean, to just give you a very quick example, not from a household level, but one of the innovations at Arcade is in the US, we are partnering with Kiwit and BERC Water to really innovate, um, uh, uh, you know, California and how do we reuse the brackish groundwater, wastewater and stormwater runoff. And that we've seen reduces energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, and it's also helping us harvest up to 4.5 million gallons of water from, from the stormwater for treatment and reusing it, and then helping us improve the beach water quality at Santa Monica Bay. So just to illustrate that, you know, just having very simple innovations that might seem like, oh, this can be done, but sometimes there are lots of blockers, which we'll discuss later, um, but scaling it to a, at a home level. And now, Roughly coming to some statistics, uh, it is the water usage is responsible for approximately 16% of water cons energy consumption in homes. So I feel we have a golden opportunity to tackle both the domestic water usage and save energy at the same time. So if we take an example from the UK, um, according to RAP, which is the Waste and Resource Action Program in the UK, each day, um, oh, over 11 billion litres of portable water are used in buildings in the UK. So on average, each individual uses roughly 150 litres. And out of that, only 7% of the water is used for drinking or cooking. And so you can imagine the rest of the water, what a waste that we have to treat it at such a high quality and, and impact the environment for what? So, so all that water could be got from somewhere else. And also the water industry contributes to 0.8% of annual UK greenhouse gas emissions. But heating water is another aspect. So in the homes, it increases this figure to 5.5% greenhouse gas emissions. So if every UK home reduced their hot water use by just 5%, the CO2 saving would be equal to roughly 600,000 cars off the roads. So you can imagine what an impact it can have to reduce water. So there's a strong business case for reducing water. And of course, leave alone saving in energy costs and all the rest of it. Um, so probably your next slide, please. So my final point is um, uh, we, we are in the process as part of the coalition to be producing a white paper on exactly this topic. And our aim is to articulate the relationship clearly at the domestic level in different cities around the world trace how we can achieve the 50 litre ambition and, and the zero carbon aspiration at the same time. What are the innovations happening in this area around the world? How do we tackle it at a systems level, looking at it from a you know, policy level, as well as to practitioners, to consumer behaviors and how they use household fittings, appliances. And, and the challenge of the opportunity, challenge and both the opportunity is really to um, reinvent, rethink and redesign models such that we, achieve our aspiration of a 50 litre and a zero carbon home. And, and I would quickly say that we need to start, we talk a lot about carbon footprint. How do we have a water footprint in tandem with the carbon footprint and work through the synergies and multi, multiple benefits it brings for people and the planet. And wherever there's a trade-off, uh, take appropriate measures. Um, and, and last but not the least, I would say we need to urgently bring along the end consumer so that they, they aspire for the 50 litre and zero carbon home. It's no good us practitioners or policy makers telling them it should come from people asking for it. And if this happens, I'm positive that we'll truly, truly be really moving closer to tackling this uh, climate and nature emergency. So, I mean, I can talk, talk for half a day on this brolio, but I realize I only had five to eight minutes, so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anusha.
I, I take, I think, two very important points from mm -hmm. your presentation, Anusha. I think it is very clear that there is a tension between our climate emergency and the perception that this will affect dramatically our quality of life. Addressing that challenge in order mm -hmm. to really engage people and citizens in Absolutely. the responses to climate emergency, it, to me, it feels very urgent right now. And I think your words have emphasized that. Mm -hmm. And a second really important point that your experience and, and your words highlighted to me are about the fact that it's time for a new way of planning our city. Mm -hmm. you know, from the perspective of our climate, climate emergency, but also be, because of the impacts of that, that climate emergency. And rethinking water and water efficiency, very importantly, is not as simple as it seems. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, we are not using CO2 emissions as one of the currencies to really right. explore those opportunities. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for highlighting so many uh, valuable entry points. And in our coalition, we look forward to continuing collaborating with you. Thank you. So in the next uh, presentation, brief presentation, brief perspective, I wanted to invite Tobias Swamberg. He is the, the leader of water solutions at IKEA. So Tobias is based in Sweden and he has substantial experience in product development and innovation processes both at IKEA and very interestingly also in the footwear industry. So he's used to making things resistant and, and durable. So Tobias, uh, first of all, welcome. We, as I said before, uh, we're really pleasured, uh, delighted to have uh, IKEA joining our coalition this week. It is really exciting for us. And uh, for us, one of the most interesting objectives, the most interesting elements of our initial conversations with you was the commit IKEA's commitments to becoming water positive by 2030. Also, in our conversations, you highlighted the importance of addressing the water footprint that comes from the water that runs through the taps and showers that IKEA sells. That's a really ambitious objective. So I was wondering, how have you approached such ambitious challenge and how does the water positive future looks like? Over to you, Tobias. Thanks, Paul. It's uh, fantastic to be uh, part of this session uh, today. Actually, it's easy to get a little bit too excited with this great partnership and joining in this uh, coalition. Uh, following the announcement we did early this week that we're joining as a founding member. So it's really great to work together here to hopefully create uh, some sort of better water future. So thanks a lot. Uh, but hey, also to all uh, digital listeners. I don't know how many joined, but we have uh, for sure quite quite a few listening that uh, find their way to this session. So I am uh, Tobias Sandberg. I work in IKEA Sweden, uh, where I lead the range and product innovation work, uh, which we are doing then in the area of uh, water. Uh, and of course, then we are in IKEA water use in the home, so domestic water use. So very shortly, the, the, the vision of IKEA are, like you see here, the, to create a better everyday life for the many people. And this we try to do not only a, as a poster on the wall in the office, but also actually something we do our best of uh, every day, all co-workers to achieve. So uh, one of our starting points is that sustainable living should not and cannot be a luxury for a few, but actually affordable and accessible for, for the many people. And one of the focus areas, key focus areas across IKEA is to enable as many people as possible to live more water efficiently at home with the ultimate goal to create or enable and inspire the water positive living. You can change slide there, Braulio. And uh, as nice to hear actually connecting very well to partly what Anusha talked about already. We, of course, look at the household's water use and already mentioned, so most already know this. Uh, but of course, depending on where and how you live, you use a little water a little bit differently. But if we, generally speaking, we know that in Europe, everyone, every one of us are using about 150 liters of water. And that is every day. In many other areas, it's actually usage are much more than this, I think up to 500 liters in in maybe the worst or the extreme uh, uh, areas. 
without mentioning where that is. Um, these huge amounts of water we use um, are in most places, I think uh, as uh, Anusha also mentioned, it's of potable quality or drinking water quality. So what do we do with all this drinking water? Yeah, we, we actually do flush down about 40 liters in our toilets. We rinse and wash our clothes with about 20 liters. And we, all of us, we shower in about 50 to 60 liters. And again, this we do every day of us. And uh, importantly, of course, we also use somewhere seven, eight liters of our water for our daily cooking and drinking. But that is only seven, eight liters out of the total of 150. So our challenge here, or our little bit provocative question here, is it really needed to use drinking water for toilet flushing, flushing, washing clothes, and as well to, to showering? I don't think so. We, we believe we need to rethink how we do these activities today. We need to start changing behavior. And changing behavior is a tricky thing. One th th change we believe we need to do is to start reuse. Again, like Anusha mentioned uh, shortly as well. Uh, so start reuse water in the home instead of flushing it down the drain immediately after one or the, the first point of use. So in, in IKEA, we have started this uh, journey to create solutions for, uh, for people to, to do so, to help uh, enable and inspire to do so. We are developing solutions, for example, very simply, uh, what we call a shower bucket made for simply collecting of shower water while you shower. A very, very simple solution that can make a, an, an, uh, an impact. To support this, we will also make it convenient for everyone to take care of the water you know, you're, you're letting down while you, your shower are warming up. You know that, that time when you start the shower in the morning, you get in, in your hand, open it up, and you get that cold splash of water, and you jump out of the shower, and then you need to stay, stand there and wait a bit before the nice and warm water reaches you, and you step into the shower. A solution to take care of that in a convenient way, so you have that water instead of uh, letting it down the drain. To more uh, complex solutions, we are also doing our collaboration with uh, a Danish startup company called Flowloop uh, that have innovated a very smart and easy, simple way to make a water recycling shower. So meaning showering into a, a closed loop of water. This uh, solution will actually disrupt the way we are used to shower uh, as we look upon it today. And our task there in IKEA is that we will, and our promise is as well, and we will make this solution also affordable for the many, not the luxury, luxury for a few. So, so what happens then if we start to re reuse our shower water, maybe twice or three or even four times during our long hot showers that we all love to take? And if we collect the shower water after we used it, which we then can use again, maybe to clean the, the kitchen floor or, or uh, something else at the home, watering plants and so on. And maybe finally we use it for flushing the toilet instead of flushing toilet with drinking water. Have we then became water positive? Maybe we have for sure come a good way to get 50 liters to feel like 500 or at least 150 maybe to start with, which is our aspiration together with a 50 liter home coalition. That's why we have a, such a fantastic match. And think of then, already and again mentioned by Anusha is that I think how much energy we have saved by reusing all this water already. So at the IKEA we are looking for convenient, smart, innovative solutions that can make this happen. And we also would like to work together with authorities to update and modernize the regulatory landscape for water solutions in the home to make it possible to bring these kind of innovative solutions actually to market in a compliant way which is not the case today. Back to this, that it's potable water we use in the home. Because there is no value for innovations that doesn't reach the user, right? It needs to reach the end user. So this is part of what we want to achieve, but as we say at IKEA, most of the job are still to be done. You could change slide probably to wrap it up from my part, over to you. Thank you so much, Tobias. Uh, 
really, for me, the, the, this vision and the emphasis that IKEA has in terms of making sustainable living uh, something that is accessible to everyone and not a privilege, I think it's just fantastic. And what your words suggest very strongly is that this obviously requires a change in behavior, including not only solutions that are very complex, but also really we all need to think about those simple solutions that we can integrate into the every, our everyday lives. That is really inspiring. And, and again, it's just such a pleasure to, to have you and your team in our coalition. So thank you. So thank now you. I would like to turn to Franz Besnik. Franz is the head of R&D for Sustainable Innovation and Procter & Gamble. And very importantly, he's the person who had the original idea of initiating a coalition, really thinking about reducing radically uh, the, the water consumption in our home in a way that, people, that could be attractive without affecting uh, uh, the quality of life of, of citizens. I call him the father of 50 liter home, one only just probably uh, <laughs> the nanny in, in, in a way. So it's just a pleasure and, and as always, Franz, it's just fantastic to, to have you in our conversation. Franz has a background in, in chemical engineering, like my father. He joined Procter & Gamble in 1997 and he has a vast experience in leading innovation experiences across the company including multiple businesses, multiple geographies, not only the developed world, but also the developing markets. And he's now heading the Procter & Gamble's R&D in Sustainable Innovation. Franz, as always, it's a pleasure to, to have you with us. And what I find really exciting about your work in, in Procter & Gamble is that your work specifically is heavily influenced by what you saw in Cape Town in the midst of the day zero scenario. Nowadays, you're one of the leading voices promoting the use of carbon as a currency to understand the impact of co and co-benefits of innovations in water usage. Please tell us about Procter & Gamble's journey and how you have embraced this com the complexities associated with sustainability and how such pioneering approach guides your work. Over to you, Franz. You're on mute. Franz, you're on mute. Well, thank you very much, Brolio. And uh, what a series of loaded questions to cover in five minutes, but I'll try my best. Um, yeah, the inspiration um, of 50 Liter Home came from Cape Town. Um, right at the time, they were facing a massive drought uh, and the looming risk of day zero. And what happens is the city constrained the population down to 50 liter per day per person. There was no choice, that was it. And, um, you know, and the population was about 120, 150, so about two to three times more in normal times. So one of the, you were talking about the, the sort of pioneering approach. One of the things that we do at PNG and one of part of my job is actually to go and meet the consumers and meet the people. Um, and, and so what we did is really spend a week time as a PNG team um, in Cape Town uh, to live life at 50 liter per day per person. What life at 50 liter per day per person where there's been no innovation when that's just been forced onto people. And what we saw is a lot of sacrifice. People reusing water, being forced to reuse water, yet not being able to treat that water in between reuse and, and doing that multiple times over the day. So a lot of hazards around health and safety and hygiene. And to be honest, I think they were very lucky that that happened before the COVID crisis. But that is just one side of the coin. As I went back uh, to look at the urban world, um, and, 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 and look at how much energy is, is happening as we flow showers through. I was absolutely shocked. Um, a lot of the water, well, first off, a lot of the water that we use in our home is heated water. Um, you know, only water of the toilet is not heated, but the rest, pretty much a lot of the rest is actually heated water. So it makes a lot of water, um, you know, uh, 70%, 60 to 70%. Now let's look at, uh, let me share just one piece of data, uh, looking at the greenhouse gas. I was so curious, okay, what's the greenhouse gas contribution of my shower um, in the morning? And so let me share that chart and decompose how it looks like. Hopefully you can see that. And what, what this chart, and, and without going into too much detail, this is about us showering in the morning. 
and on the on the on the x-axis on the horizontal axis you've got the different contributor i'm using product i'm using you know probably body wash i'm probably using a shampoo i'm having packaging uh, that actually you know of course cover the products uh, i've actually had to make those products manufacture them in a plant somewhere i had to distribute them from a plant to a to retail uh, distribution to a store to a home ultimately i'm always i'm obviously using hot water during my shower and then I've got to actually treat that uh, the waste, both the water waste and uh, the, the solid waste, the package waste in particular. Well, actually, the data is pretty self-evident. 95% of all these different contributions, hot water is actually the dominant factor by a large. It's actually 95% of the contribution of the greenhouse gas of my shower. And nobody knows that. I didn't know that. I was shocked. Um, the product I use is about 1%. The packaging I use is about 1%. The manufacturing of all of this is about 1%, the distribution and tripping of all of this is about 1% and the waste treatment is about 1%. 95% of me showering in the morning, um, greenhouse gas emission is coming from the hot water I use. And that's the same for um, hand dishing. When I'm actually doing hand dishing under my kitchen faucet, 90% of the contribution of, of the greenhouse gas of me hand dishing in the faucet is actually coming from the hot water I use. Nobody knows that, I didn't know that. Um, when actually launder, about 70%, this time a little less, but still 70% is actually a lot, is about the hot water I use. Um, when I shave in the, in the, in the sink, in the, in the bathroom sink, same, uh, a huge amount of hot water, 70% plus. When I actually wash my floors and use a bucket, 95% again is linked to the hot water I use. And nobody knows that, I didn't know that. So when you look at the cumulative effect um, of all of these water heating happening at all of these different you know, uh, events in the homes, no, no wonder why uh, water heating becomes the number, the number two contributor of the greenhouse gas in homes around the world. Um, and if I do the math, quick math, and um, hopefully Arcadis will clear the math uh, through the white paper, if I think about homes being about 35% of, of the total planet emissions, uh, the built environment, if I actually, you know, you know look at all of these events of water heating up to from 16 to 20, 25 percent, depending on the numbers. But that actually gives me um, the contributions of water heating in the homes around the world as big as airline industry. So in fact, it's an elephant in the room or it's an airplane in the bathroom in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. That's how much it is. And it's totally invisible and unknown for people. And so what does that to do with PNG uh, and, and, and the pioneering approach you're saying? Well, a couple of things. Well, first off, uh, we actually, PNG, touch every single stream of water in the homes. We, we do shampooing and, and body soaping under the shower, shaving, uh, teeth brushing uh, under the kitchen, uh, the bathroom sink, we hand dish under the kitchen sink. We launder uh, loads of clothes. And of course, um, we have a, a big toilet paper business, in the, especially in the US on the toilet. So we do to touch this stream. So we feel enormous responsibility uh, to act differently about, about the water. 70% of our business depends on that water. Um, and so, um, and 70% of our greenhouse gas actually is in scope is tied to, to, the, to the hot water. So that's basically a huge call for, you know, business, uh, you know, call for PNG. Um, now, the second big um, thing that I want to say on that is, um, as a head of sustainable innovation, the obsession I have uh, for us and for our innovation is to, lies in three words, really, is to make sustainable irresistible. And that's really important. Um, there's many ways you can actually decide to do sustainability. Um, I've decided that we're going to make sustainable irresistible. And that's, that's really meaning it. Uh, sustainable solutions should not just be equal, should not just be about the same. They should be irresistibly better. Like people should go for this sustainable solution like there's no tomorrow. It's because simply it's going to be better than anything that exists today. And that's my criteria number one. You know, not, number one criteria is it's got to be irresistible versus today. It's got to be better. And that's really important because it's going to drive the speed of adoption uh, of the many people we want to serve in the world, um, you know, in the face of the climate urgency. Um, so make sustainable irresistible clearly is part of the pioneering approach. Last but not least is very obvious. We cannot do this alone. No way. PNG, we touch every stream of water, but I don't do uh, appliances. I don't do uh, showers. I don't do laundry. Uh, machines um, and um, and down the, you know and I'm I'm, I'm not even working uh, I was not working with utilities if we don't do that if we don't rally a coalition or the entire value chain of water um, and energy 
if we do not create a stakeholders group that includes not only the private, but the public uh, all together, um, we will not uh, create a, a future that is sustainable. So we've got to work collectively. We've got to work in a systemic transformative change. And that's why we've been so much keen in spearheading that 50 to home coalition that rallies these public private stakeholders to really create the system change. Uh, so hopefully make homes of tomorrow uh, that we run at 50 liters per day per person, it feel like 500 liters and at zero carbon. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Very inspiring uh, words. And I think your words re-emphasize the importance of us uh, engaging in how we contribute to education, how we contribute to the changes in behavior. But very importantly, I think it highlights the, our individual responsibilities. When we use water to observe, to think about how much impact we are creating. And the vision on the airplane in the bathroom is you know, just fantastic. And I think it clarifies the scale of the, of the challenge. And, or, and of course, the vision on creating uh, innovations that are irresistible basically challenge these ideas, as Anusha mentioned initially, that addressing climate change is something that will affect our uh, quality of life. I think the vision that you propose in terms of thinking and dreaming and envisioning a better quality of life is something that can really uh, be transformational for the future. So thank you so much, Franz, as always. And now I would like to invite uh, Caroline Reyes. Caroline is uh, the Urban Resilience Director of Catholic Relief Services in Freetown in Sierra Leone. Her background is economics and urban planning, and she has worked in the public sector, in the private sector in France, as well as in urban resilience initiatives like 100 Resilient Cities, where we work together in a couple of cities in, in Africa. And for us, it was important to invite Caroline as well as Bianca, who will be addressing this, uh, this room uh, later on. It was important to bring the perspective of the, of the doers, the people who actually drive and deliver change on the ground. And highlighting the challenges they experience is something that of course is critical for us as a coalition and the reason why we are willing to expand our partner base in the future to working with local governments as well as NGOs. So Caroline, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, just to, to, to kick off this conversation, uh, I was wondering from your perspective as a practitioner leading the Catholic Relief Services resilience work in Freetown, what are the tools that have helped you to create innovative approaches such as the free, for example, the Freetown Water Fund? Also, what are the factors that we, in, in a collaborative uh, initiative like 50 Liter Home, should take into consideration in order to achieve real impact in African cities? Over to you, Carrie. Thank you so much, Braulio, for that introduction and uh, for having me today. It's really great uh, to be here with you uh, again, to be reconnected and also to be speaking alongside such a high caliber a group of panelists. Um, so um, let me just share my screen um, to start off. One second. All right. Are you able to see my screen? It's coming. Yep, we can. Great. So first, um, I just wanted to set a bit the context for uh, everyone. Um, this is Freetown and the Western Arab Peninsula, uh, the, the natural park that's found in the Western Arab Peninsula. And um, there are significant threats right now for uh, this uh, area uh, in terms of uh, water security uh, and climate change as well. Um, over the past 50 years, the population of Freetown has increased almost tenfold. Uh, and at the same time, we've seen uh, more than 50% of um, the uh, forest cover has been uh, lost during that uh, same period due to uh, increased urbanization and illegal activities going on, agriculture expansion as well into that area. 
that has significant impacts for water security because uh, the, the forests that are found in the Western Arab Peninsula National Park, which is really very close to Freetown, 90% uh, of the water that goes to Freetown and the surrounding communities comes from those forested catchments. So with rapid deforestation and degradation, what we're seeing is an increase in sedimentation and a re significant reduction in the lifespan of two of the key uh, dams, the Guma and Congo Dam reservoirs. And it's important to mention that the situation already is very dire in Freetown and the surrounding areas. Only 3% of the population have access to piped water, uh, pipe drinking water. 40% uh, of the population rely on public taps. And you have around 25% of the population that doesn't even have any kind of access to um, improved sources of water and they rely on streams and rivers. Uh, and so um, with uh, increased deforestation, we're likely to see a, a huge uh, issue around water scarcity, especially for low income uh, residents in Freetown and the surrounding area. Uh, the deforestation has also other impacts. We're uh, seeing increased uh, re risks of flooding and uh, landslides as well. Um, uh, deforestation is also impacting uh, the very rich wildlife of Sierra Leone. Here you see the endangered uh, Western, area, Western chimpanzee, which is found in these areas. So we're seeing a, a host of um, negative impacts for people and uh, nature all, all together. And uh, also the forests that are found in the Western Air Peninsula Park are actually one of the most critical assets that Sierra Leone has to combat climate change and its social uh, and economic impact. So uh, we're really uh, threatening the, 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 the city and the surrounding area under significant threat. And so to tackle this issue, uh, CRS, uh, the Nature Conservancy and uh, our government partners here uh, with the government of Sierra Leone and local governments, Freetown City Council and Ward, uh, the Western Air Rural Development uh, District as well, uh, have joined forces to set up a, a water fund. So this water fund is uh, a governance and financing mechanism which will unite public private and civil society organizations around one common goal, which is to address water scarcity through investments in nature-based solutions. So when you ask me uh, what are innovative approaches that we're looking at and what are the tools to promote the, those approaches for us, innovation looks like this. It's investing in nature-based solutions, investing in this critical asset that is already found and very close to the city, uh, rather than trying to build uh, a dam further up and connecting it to the city. So uh, innovation for us, again, is investing and harnessing uh, nature, harnessing nature's ability to capture, to filter um, water, uh, harnessing that natural water cycle uh, that uh, will provide a number of uh, ecosystem uh, benefits uh, for the city, for people and nature. Uh, the second piece for us in terms of innovation is the governance piece. So as I mentioned, the water fund is both a governance and financing piece. What it does is that it brings together communities who are uh, downstream, such as water utilities, government, large water users, such as beverage companies, for instance, they invest in the fund and those funds that they've put into it will be used upstream uh, to, to support conservation activities, to invest in nature-based solution upstream um, that uh, communities, NGOs, uh, environmental stewards will implement. So the the innovation here is about uh, balancing those upstream and downstream uh, interests. It's about uh, bringing together, uh, Franz mentioned this, he talked about collaboration and partnerships. So it's about bringing together stakeholders that don't necessarily have a platform to engage. So public, private, and civil society around one common goal. It's also about uh, financing and ensuring that we have sustainable financing for conservation efforts. Um, with the water fund, we'll be able to pull resources from different stakeholders. But here in the case of Freetown, we've also seen that uh, there's a huge potential to uh, leverage uh, co-financing through carbon credits because we have this forest, we have these this critical ecosystem, and we can already uh, tap into um, uh, funding through carbon credits because of that. So that is what innovation looks like for us. It's been uh, a bit challenging to, to, to uh, make that shift and encourage uh, uh, people, whether in government or outside of government, to embrace nature-based solutions, but we've made that, um, that uh, progress now. Uh, so 
one of the key tools that has helped us overcome this barrier has actually been the development of a business case. Having a business case that demonstrates that a water fund is one, economically feasible, and two, will have long-term positive benefits was really crucial. And to do that, um, we've uh, conducted a number of scientific studies. We did modeling. We looked at what are potential interventions that this fund can finance and looked at their uh, impact in terms of water, looked at their impacts in terms of reduction of uh, flood risks, landslide risks, uh, costed those interventions and came up with a cost benefit analysis, which shows us that to protect and restore this uh, forest, which will supply water to Freetown today and in the future, we need around uh, 20 million US dollars. And those 20 US million dollars will result in 55 million dollars uh, in terms of benefits for all stakeholders in the Western Air Peninsula, National, Midwestern Air Peninsula. So that has been a very critical tool for us, having that business case showing the economic feasibility and the, potential, the positive um, impacts. Um, your, your second question has to do with uh, what are some factors that uh, stakeholders in your network need uh, to, to, to look at. I say the first one is uh, local ownership. Any solution that has to be preferred, preferred has to be um, appropriate and owned locally. Uh, understanding local systems and working with local systems is also extremely important. So developing frameworks that help uh, partners understand the challenges within the system and come up with solutions that are locally uh, appropriate. Um, I would say that um, in addition to uh, these elements, it's important also to uh, ensure that uh, these solutions are affordable. Uh, when we think of affordability, we need to think both of the willingness to pay for that service, ensuring that uh, uh, people understand that this is service that is needed and uh, that they're willing to pay for that price, but also that they have the capacity to pay for that. So looking at how you subsidize some of these services, for instance. Uh, also looking at whether there's local expertise to implement that solutions. Do you have the, the right supply chains in place as well to implement uh, that solution? These are some of the factors that I think will be critical for, for uh, your partners to look at uh, when uh, coming up with solutions and trying to scale them up. Thank you very much, Carolyn. This is really inspiring and, and thank you for the opportunity to learn from you, from your experience. Uh, it is really important. I think th there are a number of mes messages that are important reminders for us. But also we need to think about nature-based solutions. What is the role of nature-based solutions everywhere in cities? Also think about governance and financing and spaces for innovation particularly when we are thinking about delivering change on the ground. And finally, not to forget the business case. And if we extrapolate uh, that thinking into a coalition, what is the business case for 50 liter per day per person net zero living? Is there a, a business case? And if so, uh, why aren't we investing on that? So thanks, Carol, as always. Uh, and now very quickly, I would like to turn to our last uh, panelist, Bianca Naiho. Bianca is the managing director of the Netherlands Water Partnership. Her background is in environment and, and ecology, and she's a sustainability professional with past experience across the private sector and public sector internationally. Uh, previously, she worked at Arcadis, and since 2019, she leads the Netherlands Water Partnership. Bianca, it's a pleasure to, to have you with us. The Netherlands is a global water leader in global leader in integrating water in all aspects of public policy. What are the challenges and lessons you can share with others outside the Netherlands? And also, what are the emergency policy challenges associated with more complex uh, issues such as climate emergency and their increasing impacts? Over to you, Bianca. Well, thank you, Braulio, and thank you for the wonderful introduction, both me, the organization, and also for, with regard to the Netherlands. Um, I think we are learning our lessons actually lately with extreme floodings happening in Europe and also in the Netherlands and, uh, and droughts happening. In, um, but let me take you along in the journey maybe we as the Netherlands have taken over the last couple of years. Before I go into that, so the Netherlands Water Partnership, just so you know, we are a network of around 180 organizations, which includes government, so the local, regional, national government, 
knowledge institutes, NGOs, social and environmental ones, and businesses. Okay, this is a, a proud member of NWP, um, but as are smaller um, SMEs um, working on technology, water technology, but also uh, more Delta technology solutions. So looking at the Netherlands as a country, um, low-laying country, more than 50% of the country, almost 60% of the country prone to flooding from either rivers or the sea. Um, and at the same time, since 2018, we are dealing with droughts. So there's a lot happening related to water. Um, the economic center of the Netherlands is in the lowest laying part and the water use in the Netherlands is quite, uh, quite high. Um, so this is where we come from. And having lived with water for ages, um, the way we are dealing with water in the Netherlands is, is through policy. And it is, it's ingrained within the whole structures which we have. So we have water authorities which actually manage the water within the Netherlands. Against flooding, the protection and against flooding is partially in their hands, as is uh, providing uh, drinking water together with drinking water com uh, companies. And we have done so and we've learned how effective this is actually. We had floods in 1916, floods in 1953, 93, 95, and quite recently, and except for the last two occasions, there weren't any casualties. But before that, there were also casualties. So this, this really made us realize we have to do something. And it's something we have to live with. We live with water, not we don't fight against it. We live with it. So we have uh, set up a Delta Commission in 2008. And this Delta Commission, um, it actually organizes uh, um, many things. It, it deals with the protection against flooding. It deals with the amount of water we have available as a population, and it also deals with the quality of water. And there's a numerous acts coming out of that. The main thing is this is collaboration. It's collaboration between the national government <clears throat> with the Delta Commissioner, with the regional governments, with the water authorities, the drinking water authorities. And actually everybody is involved, which means a lengthy process. A lot of talk, which in Dutch we call polder, but in the end, when it comes down to, to disasters happening or we need to act quickly, it allows us to, to act quickly. And just a number, the Delta Fund, we actually made a reservation of 1 billion euro a year to work on this. So 1 billion euro, mind you, and that's what we have set for the, the next, I think it's about next 20 years to come. We agree that this is what we're going to spend on protecting us. So it's very much about, about collaboration. So to keep Netherlands safe, an attractive place to live and to work. So we also, it's not only about being safe, but it's being safe in a sustainable way, in a flexible way, but also in a solidary way. So taking into account everybody, and um, it is actually as such that we can't have a protection against flooding, like an insurance against flooding, because it's paid with by everybody in the country, even people who live in areas which are not prone to flooding, which is little of the Netherlands, but they also pay to this in the same kind of bucket as everybody else does who lives in flood prone areas. So this is what we call also the solidarity principle. Um, so the Delta program consists of a number of programs that set safety, fresh water, and we also have ingrained it in all different kinds of acts which we have globally. So there's talk about now the Spatial Adaptation Act. When we develop the country further in the Spatial Adaptation Act, water will get this specific place. It's not there yet, but because of what's happening with water over the last couple of years, again, the droughts in 2018, from which we only recovered the beginning of this year, and then like a couple of months ago, the, the, the quite disastrous floods happening in the south of the Netherlands, where as, as unfortunately in Belgium and Germany, we had casualties. Because of the system we had in place, we are very happy to say that we didn't have casualties. And the system is about prevention. So that's how we design everything which we do. Then it's sustainable spatial planning, which is limiting the effects of flooding. So we have room for the river projects. Um, we have using also the nature-based solutions, which the previous speaker addressed as well, very important. We allow rivers to flood spaces, which we don't need, which is nice nature, sometimes even farming land, which can be flooded um, while when there is high water um, happening. And then there's this crisis management, and we had to use it a couple of months ago. We have the systems in place and the different authorities quickly communicating with one another. And I know we're short on time, so I'm gonna wrap up, uh, Braulio. Um, so the focus elements which we have as the Netherlands and which I think are lessons learned from us over the long time, 
it's the integrated approach involve everybody it takes a longer preparation time but in the end when it comes to taking action you can act quicker so we work with long-term visions again the delta plan it's it's a long long-term plan short-term actions and really no regret measures there's a legal basis of the program including long-term financing i mentioned the one billion a year good governance is key Clear processes of decision making. We have set out those lines, and there's, this is where the European Commission now comes in as well with the Green Deal, where we again have extra funding and extra decisions and tools actually um, available. We use a lot of modeling tools, consistent evaluation. So we have to we evaluate it again after the floods happening a couple of years, a month ago, using scenario planning, planning up to like 50 to 100 years from now especially important with uh, climate change, working together with the member base, we have academic, private and public sector and technology technology innovations. And I would say nature-based solutions are key in, uh, in, in, in tackling these, these issues. Thank you very much, Bianca. I think your, your presentation emphasizes the importance of collaboration and also learning from the past, from recent events and in historical events, and use the learning to create a long-term vision and a better financial instrument. That's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, I, now I wanted to, to turn to my colleague Deepa, who has been managing the questions from those participating in, in, in this panel. Deepa, I was wondering if there is any question that you would like to share with our panel. Sure, uh, thank you, Braulio. So there's, there's one question for Franz Besnik from PNG, um, and this is from Nina Van Tolwon. Um, and Nina wants to know if um, uh, Franz from PNG, uh, is, is your water use in mechanical recycling included in the calculations of water use that you talked about? Um, and in this context, would refilling systems contribute to a reduction in water use uh, in recycling? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand totally the question, but if I do, I would say that the, the, the numbers I share are the number of, um, of water coming off the showers, the taps, and the fixtures, uh, which is by far the biggest portion of the water use. I mean, typically, I, since we, we are in showers, we've talked a lot about showers. I said a 10-minute shower uses up to 100 liters um, you know, of, of, uh, of water. Off of that, a PNG product, a PNG shampoo, uh, dose under that shower would be a 20 mil dose of a shampoo of which maybe, you know, I'd say 20 mil, you know, probably 10, 10 mil of liquid of, of water. So 10 mil of, of, of water coming off of our PNG product uh, versus 100 liters of water coming, coming off the shower. So really, there's a disproportionate amount of, of water use, of course, coming off the taps and, and, and showers versus of PNG products. Having said that, we do care about products and the water we put in our, in our products. We uh, work on concentration a lot. I mean, the you know new products, forms, uh, pods, laundry, or more concentrated versions of, of our products is really an important undertaking we do so that we cut off the water um, off of our products by 50, even more percent. In fact, getting to dry form, uh, ultimately, we presented in, uh, in the Las Vegas show last January, uh, uh, you know, a stamp, uh, you know, a new product generation in the form of a stamp, a dry stamp that actually is a shampoo and it's actually dissolving in front of your eyes under the shower water it contains no water. So we do uh, want to uh, out innovate in the product itself. So we ultimately can remove water, water there for, for sure. But again, the, the, the water that is the most important uh, part of it, of the use is the one that flows off of our showers and ends up, as Tobias said, you know, in drainage, um, a lot of drinking water that, that is used to, uh, to, to uh, flush toilets. Hopefully that, that addresses the question and hopefully I understood it decently enough. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Um, there's one more comment, not a question, but a comment, and I think something to reflect on for, for the whole panel. Um, someone mentions here that it is interesting to see how household consumption of water and how innovatively one can reduce the water footprint. But um, uh, something to reflect on is that domestic consumption of fresh water is only about 10% of the total water use, and the remaining 90% is used for agriculture food production, that is about 70%, and about 20% is by industries. 
um, and therefore the virtual hidden virtual water hidden in our food products and other products can really help us save a lot of fresh water. Um, yeah, and it, 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 he says that the bathtub filled is only about 400 liters, while a hamburger through its whole value chain will uh, will have up to 200 2500 liters of virtual water in it. So. Uh, buying and choosing what to eat and what to wear can help us save a lot of water. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to speak up again. Sorry to bother people, but decisions about food that impacts agriculture, decisions about buying clothes that impacts industry are taken in the homes of the consumer and in, in the homes of consumers that do not know about water usage at all. So I think here is the bet. Here is the ambition, the bigger ambition be behind 50 at home. Well, let's start by understanding the relationship with the water we see as an entry point. And if we can get people to really start to um, you know, be responsible and joyful about the water they use and they see, I guess the, ne the next step is how are we going to get into the debate about the water we don't see, the water we eat, the water we wear in clothes. So I think the ambition of 52 will go way beyond the water we use into the water we eat and the water we, uh, we wear because ultimately those decisions are made by consumers in their homes. And I think this is part of recreating a relationship with the water first we see and then the water we don't. So, you know, stay tuned. Uh, we can't solve all problems at once. Um, I think we talk about the, the water, but also the nexus with the energy and the energy impact is way bigger. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned. There's much more to come. If, if I can maybe add to that. Um, 20 seconds, Bianca. Yeah, so I'll do it very short. I echo what Franz says, and my answer would have been the same. It's about awareness raising. And I can tell you there's a lot happening already in the in the food sector. And, and maybe as an example, um, another example would be if you cleaning the water. So at, as utilities and drinking water companies do, they already take out products which you can use as facial cream, for example, again. And also that to me is the story behind it, which is about awareness raising. So echo what Frances, awareness raising. Thank you very much. So unfortunately we need to, to, to finish this discussion because of, of times, but again, thank you so much to all the participants, everyone who's listening uh, to this, in, this fantastic and really insightful uh, panel. And again, thank you so much uh, to the panelists. It, this has been a fantastic uh, learning opportunity and look forward to our next discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.